Hi, welcome back to Recipe for Crazy. It's Alana Noel. First and foremost, let me start by saying I suck and I know it, but I have every fucking excuse to suck. Okay. I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to have to pull the cancer card on you. Okay. My mom has cancer. As you know, I can't really joke about this. This is actually really serious and sad, but my sister and I had to call hospice. I'm whispering because my mom still doesn't even know it's hospice. She signed the papers on her own, but it is hospice. And yeah, it's not great. Dark times here. We're trying to make light of it. We're, I mean, not, we're not trying to make light of it, but we're trying. My sister and I are doing the best we can. I'm trying to make my mom as comfortable as she possibly can be while also not having nervous breakdowns, at least taking turns with the nervous breakdowns, like two people can't have it at the same time, which has happened over the past couple of weeks. And that was not pretty a story for another time when we've all recovered. But um, yeah, it's been very difficult. And because of that, it's been hard for me to produce any type of content, which obviously I, you know, that is how I make money through podcasting and posting online. And I'm unable to do that right now. And that's okay. And I miss it because I love doing it. You know, it's only been a couple of days at this point, but I have to take care of myself too, while this is all happening. And right now my sister and I are basically on 24 hour duty with my mom as we're getting everything set up with the nurses and everything. The place that we're using has been incredible and literally like saints and amazing. And I'm so fucking thankful that this exists because let me tell you, this is fucking hard. This is really hard. And, um, yeah, so that's what's happening here. Um, and why it's been difficult for me to get on a microphone and talk when that's all I really love to do is talk to myself. So yeah, I have a guest today and I'm so freaking excited for her to be here because I need her desperately. And I pray to God that she comes back again as a guest on the show because she ha- was really actually so helpful. She said things I already knew, which I think with dating and being single, it's like you already know a lot of these things, but it really helps to have somebody confirm it and tell you and to take you out of the fucking Delulu shit that you're stuck in. Uh, Her name is JD. She's on Instagram as Matchmade in Hollywood. She is a matchmaker in Los Angeles. She sets up a lot of people that are in entertainment. And I know her because I know her husband, which is a funny story, which we get to in the end. You definitely want to listen to that. Awkward. Not really awkward. This girl's freaking amazing. I'm obsessed with her. I love her. She used to work on Family Guy. She's a writer. She has a book coming out about all of her matchmaking and dating. And it's a fucking hallmark story. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. I'm so excited to have her on the show. And you know, my interview skills are a little rusty. I don't even like doing like interview interviews. Like whenever I have people on the show, it's never going to be like a fucking traditional interview because I think that's so dumb. Like, let's have a conversation. Let's be real human beings. I don't like to listen to shit like that. And I don't want to do shit like that. That's not how I did it as a producer working in television. It's not how I'm going to do it here. That's it. We're going to run the show how we want to fucking run the show and fuck everybody else. And you know what? Life is fucking short. Okay. That's how I feel about everything right now. I might get a face tattoo. I just might. I don't know. Shit's crazy. Who knows? Anyways, welcome to the show, JD. Let's talk, baby. Also, um, if you want to help me out in any way, you make, make me feel better about my tragic, sad life, rate me a five-star review. I don't care if you hate this show. Just do it. Make me happy. You know, give back to the community. Me, I'm the community. You know, get some good karma flowing your way. Okay. We're going to try to be regular here with the podcasting because I actually fucking love this when I'm sitting and editing it. I love it. I'm so happy. Wow. You came in at exactly five minutes. I asked my sister for five minutes and literally it's been five minutes exactly. And she came back in. So that's perfect. Anyways, let's start the show. I have so many questions for you. It's not even funny. It was like running through my mind all day because it's very rare. You get to talk to somebody, which first of all, okay. I just have to start by saying this. First of all, I'm back to podcasting. It's been like a month. So you have to excuse me. I'm a freaking hot mess and it is what it is. But 
you and I know each other, don't really know each other. You're married to somebody that I worked with. And I have to say, this is kind of funny. So your husband reached out to me to suggest you come on the podcast. And when he initially messaged me, I'm not even going to lie. I was like, excuse me, because first of all, (laughs) men are dumb. Okay. And they don't realize what they're saying. And he was like, you know, my wife can come on your podcast and like fix all your dating problems in one session. And I was like, um, excuse me, who says I have dating problems? Um, yeah, and- what's up with that? He's going to get a little, little talking to you tonight. Right. And he's like, well, isn't your podcast called Recipe for Crazy? I'm like, uh, yeah, because we're rebranding the word crazy. I'm not crazy. I mean, I'm crazy, but I'm not like crazy. But I don't, I mean, maybe I do have dating problems. I don't know. Maybe I do. I think the problem might be the people you're dating. He says it's you. Oh, it's definitely not me. I'm perfect for sure. We're going to, we're going to get to the bottom of it. Can we? I don't know. We've, how long have we have like an hour? (laughs) We have an hour to fix all my problems. Well, let me ask you. Okay. So what makes you qualified to be a person to give dating advice and all those things? I want to know. Oh my God. This is the exact question I asked myself when (sighs) I first resisted going into this line of work because I have to tell you, everyone who is in the matchmaking industry eventually explores date coaching simply because it's more lucrative. I mean, we can get into reasons for that. But I think at the time when it was first suggested to me that I get into date coaching, I was very resistant. I mean, I wasn't even engaged or married at the time. I was dating, I was like in a very toxic relationship, in fact. And it just felt like it would be total imposter syndrome to just start telling other people how to date when my own love life hadn't been figured out. But then it got to a point where it had to have been like around a decade of matchmaking people. And I basically became this reluctant expert. After 10 years, I'm hearing thousands of feedback after everyone's dates from the men, the women, straight people, queer people, like just all kinds of date feedback. And so much of it was repetitive. Even the ones that were unexpected, like there were so many patterns that emerged and it got to a point where I felt like I had such a good handle on what people were doing right, what they were doing wrong. And it felt like I was doing a disservice to the people I was working with if they were interested to not step in and say, hey, you know, this little thing that you do is bothering a lot of people, you know, maybe just stop talking about your ex on a first date. You know, that's a very basic one that I think a lot of people know, but little tips and tricks that like even with the slightest adjustment would just completely change their ability to really connect with people in a meaningful way on a first date. And so I was having this bird's eye view and getting to see them in a way that they couldn't see themselves. I mean, I wish when I was single, I could go to someone and be like, hey, that guy that I was really interested in who never called me, do you know why? Um, And someone would know why. Like, that's an amazing insight. And so it just got to a point where I felt like it was only right for me to get into that line of work too. And so now I do date coaching and matchmaking, which I think often go hand in hand. But I guess to answer your question, I I really didn't think I was someone qualified to do that until I became that way, I guess. Well, it makes sense because if you've been matchmaking for 10 years, you're having this ongoing dialogue with so many singles hearing how the date went, what went right, what went wrong, and exactly what you said, you start hearing the same things over and over again. So naturally, you become an expert because you you are getting this hands-on experience from consistently talking to these people, dating. And I looked at your website, and I saw there were a ton of freaking married people that you guys set up. Like, you have a very high success rate just even and I'm sure you don't even have everybody on the website because I'm sure not everybody because you do like Hollywood celebrity or I don't know Hollywood whatever matchmaking so I'm sure not everybody wants to be displayed on there so you do actually find people partners which is crazy you have more success in the bachelor that's for sure just based on the website Yes, there's definitely people who the the ones you saw are the ones who essentially agreed to let us share their story. Um, And then there's 
authors, but yeah, it's, it's a really fun group of people to work with. And I think we have had, you know, a lot of success. It's hard because as a, the matchmaker brain in me is always comparing our stats to the date coach in me. And I know when I'm sitting down with a client and having a session with them, I could spend 30 minutes with somebody and I know they're going to walk away with at least something actionable that they can do differently to maybe have a positive effect on their dating life. And so in a way, that's like a hundred percent success rate, at least the way I think about it and what makes me so passionate about it. With matchmaking, you're always, I mean, if you're good at your job and working with a lot of people, you're really going to have more failures than successes. And so it is good to look at the number of success stories rather than the percentage of success, because realistically, especially for someone like me who only works with referrals, I'm not going to just like walk up to a hot guy at Whole Foods and hand a business card out. If we have time, I have so many questions about how you started doing this and all that. But I kind of want to do an experiment, which initially when your husband was like, oh, she can fix all your dating problems. I was like, I don't have dating problems, but maybe I do. Maybe I do. Like, let's talk about it. Can you help me? I mean, we should also talk about his people problem. (laughs) He does have people problems. (laughs) You know what it is? He has has no filter, but you know, his heart's in the right place. He loves love as much as I do and is such a hopeless romantic. And he probably, I mean, I think, you know, followers of yours, um, of the podcast and social media, like they see how awesome you are. He knows you, he knows you're awesome. So he's probably like, oh, my wife sets people up. Oh, she's an awesome single gal. Like maybe there's a way that they can you know, help each other. So I think it was coming from a good place, but I definitely um, would not have, I I wouldn't have reached out in that fashion, nor do I necessarily even think that you need that kind of assistance. I haven't even talked to you yet. What's the first question? What do you ask me? When I'm first meeting with clients, I like to do kind of like a general assessment of where you're at in your dating life, a brief overview of the history in terms of how it's affected your mindset in the present. The big things that I try to cover in a first session, I want to get a sense of your confidence level on dates. I get the feeling that at least the way you present that it's high. False confidence for sure. I lead with false confidence. I do have too much. (laughs) Actually, people tell me that, like, where do you get your confidence? I'm like, excuse me, are you saying I shouldn't be confident? (laughs) (laughs) I love it, right? So that's a category I wouldn't, everyone has insecurities. I'm sure if we talked long enough, I would get to the bottom of what yours are. But what I'm mainly concerned about with at least the early stages of dating is how you present and you present as someone very confident. And so that's not something I would probably you know, talk about for too long with you. Nervous dating habits is a big one. There are so many people that are like, you're totally open and unfiltered on podcasts, but are you that way on a date? Is there anything about the way that you present that is different from how you are with friends or publicly? I can tell you that before I met Dave, when I was single, I was so formal on dates guys would never realize I was even interested because I would appear like very aloof, had total resting bitch face. I'd sit up straight. I'd sip my drinks. I even spoke very formally. And it was just sort of this persona that I would resort to in order to feel comfortable. But it had, you know, it was totally counterintuitive to like getting to hook up with the guy or going on a second date because I just wasn't being myself. And so that's only something you can answer. Are you on dates the way you are with listeners? This is where I struggle, actually. So my problem is very unique to probably anybody else who dates because so what I do when I meet people is I try not to give my Instagram or TikTok or podcast information until I absolutely have to because it feels like this is like my personal diary and it's like an unfair advantage. And if anything, I feel like my podcast is a misrepresentation of who I am. Like these Mm -hmm. are my intrusive, real thoughts to things you wouldn't say out loud. And every human being in my mind, I mean, I know because I'm also a human has these crazy, has crazy thoughts. You just don't say them, but I do 
for entertainment purposes. And so I don't have a problem meeting men, the early stages of dating where my problem comes along. And like, I don't feel nervousness and my, I rep, I feel like I am really representing myself on dates, but my problem is that they start getting confused. Like, who are you? Are you this person that is on the podcast that's talking about sleeping with guys and doing this and doing that? Or are you this girl? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm who is in front of you. I, I've had this argument with uh, like a couple of people, actually, like I'm this person who's sitting in front of you. Like, for instance, there's this guy that I really liked, you know, I'm still kind of talking to him, never slept with him, went on a ton of dates. And he feels like he doesn't know who I am because of the podcast, really, and my page. So that's kind of, it's kind of weird. I don't know. It's a weird problem that I have. Believe it or not, I know it feels really, I mean, it is unique in the sense that you have a very specific set of circumstances that are, you know, special to to your life. But in terms of the actual you presenting in a way that is your authentic self, but they're not knowing if it is or isn't because of your entertainment persona is something that I not only deal with a ton with clients because there's actors, um, you know, there's just different professions where their public life is very different from how they are in private. And I think you'd be surprised to learn, like I actually fell into that category when I was single too, because at the time I was working on Family Guy, I'd written an episode before I left, but the majority of my time there, I was an executive assistant. And I was really trying to sort of prove that I had the chops to write on the show. And it was back when X was Twitter and it was really, really popular. It was all about, for me, accumulating a following and competing with the writers on the show. I was filthy on there sometimes. And I am so straight edge and like proper and so right. different from the way that I write. Yes, exactly. Right. And so at the time when I was on these dating apps, I think part of me was like, you know what, there's going to be more men that I'm not into than I am into. So if someone comes across my profile, I might as well have like a link to my social media, increase my following. So like a guy might be interested. And even if I didn't like him, at least he could follow me on Twitter. Right. And so I would have a link there and guys would see it, even ones I was interested in and would go on dates with. And it didn't take me long to realize they had like false expectations of what my personality was like, because it was so desperate from the way that I wrote. And I think they expected me to have more edge and to be kind of like into kinky shit and like things that just weren't me. I almost had to undo certain expectations that they had. And so I wasn't even starting from scratch, which wasn't fair at all. And I eventually removed the link to my social media and had a very, and this isn't really something that you can do because all you have to do is just Google your name and people, you know, if someone's interested and they're going to come across it, but at least from the outset, I would give like a very organic first impression because my writing wouldn't precede me, but it's actually something like what you're talking about is more common than you think. Yeah. For a while, actually, I had my middle name on my social media because people were finding me just with my first name and DMing me. And I just don't think it's fair because it, and this is what I say to men. It's like me coming to your job before we even get to meet each other and seeing you at work. Like it's like feels very just intrusive, I guess. But now I have my real name on there. But um, I don't know. It is weird. And like social media is just so hard with dating because everybody wants to see your social media. They want to see what you present to the world. And, but in reality, I mean, in my mind, it's so stupid. It's like, who freaking cares? I would prefer that the guy I date doesn't even have a social media. That would be my preference. I mean, I definitely understand why that's appealing. But, you know, think of it this way. At the end of the day, look at look at someone like Taylor Swift, right? Guys, probably some of them might have been fearful of dating her because if it didn't work out, they might end up in a song, right? Yeah. And not in a good way. Yeah. Um, but then there's yeah. someone like her current boyfriend who is like... They're all so scared of being in videos. Oh, my God. I, I will make a video and they do fear that. And then I'm like, is this guy being nice 
because he's scared I'm going to make a video about him? Or is he being nice because he wants to be nice? Like, I I get so confused. It has made dating so freaking hard. I mean, not that hard, but kind of hard, like for like something serious, you know? It's an added complication that you have given yourself. However, I think the pros outweigh the cons. And I think the right guy I mean, it will prove itself in time. Like if someone's just being nice because they don't want to end up in a video, they're not going to spend the rest of their lives with you to not end up in a video, right? Like eventually their true nature will be revealed. Yeah, I'll have to baby trap them to get them to do that. Stuff. Right? Just like thre- threaten them with a... Uh... I'm pregnant! <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, like a video is sort of your version of that. But, you know, the right guy, I think, will see through it all. I do think there is something to getting ahead of it because it's not something you can necessarily hide. I, I also think, by the way... You should own it and be proud of it. And I think an intelligent guy, which I don't, I mean, based on what I know about you and of you, like I don't see you ending up with a guy that's not very intelligent. And an intelligent guy is going to be able to understand like, hey, I have this persona. A lot of it is inspired by real happenings in my life, but here's how I'm really different. And I hope you'll take the time to actually get to know me. If you're upfront about that and genuine and someone has the inability to differentiate, I mean, I need to know more now about this guy that you're seeing. This would blow your mind. Do you want to hear what he did? I definitely want to hear what he did. I haven't even talked about this in the podcast. Let me tell you what he did. Okay. First of all, we went on three dates, maybe four. Okay. Tell me what you think about this. I like Tim, whatever. But you know, three dates. We're just dating, haven't had sex, nothing. It was a Wednesday, okay? I get a text message from a random number. He says, hey, it's Brian. I just got back in town. Coincidentally, a month prior, I was chatting with somebody named Brian from Bumble who was in Columbia for a month, okay? He's like, I'm back in town. Let's go out. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm free this weekend. He's like, no, tonight. He's like being super persistent, like cancel your whatever you got going on tonight. Let's go out tonight. I said, I can't, I can't. I go out with the other guy. I've been calling him Luke. I've been calling Brian Urkel too. That, that's have whatever. That Those have been their fake names on my page, whatever. So I go out with quote unquote Luke that night. We have a great time. We kiss. We end up telling each other we like each other. All those things. He leaves the house. Bye. Then I get a text from Urkel <laughs> reconfirming the date that I said I'd go out with him on, fr- with him on Friday. And then Luke texts me and says what are you doing tomorrow? Which was Friday. And I said, Oh, I have plans, but I'll can't, I can cancel them with like a smiley face. And he's like, I know you made them right next to me. I find out he claims that his friend Urkel happened to match with me a month ago, blah, blah, blah. The whole thing seemed really weird. It was like this whole test. I end up calling because it was a new number. It wasn't the original number I was messaging Urkel from. I end up calling the original number the next day. And I find out that he doesn't even know these people. He doesn't know Luke. He doesn't know any of these people. He's no, he's still out of town. Come to find out, but long story short, it was a coincidence that he happened to say the name Urkel, whatever. It was a total coincidence. And he was at lunch with his friend, the guy I was seeing and talking about me. And they decided to like test me to see if I would take a date with another guy. The number of red flags in this story, I don't even know if you should get me started. Okay, but let, me, uh, there, let me tell yeah, you this. Keep he is a giant dick. Okay, JD, he's a giant penis. I'm very intrigued by the penis. I don't know what, okay, so what, what I, dating I, advice I don't you can give me with that. I need an hour with you to figure out what the issue is. <laughs> Would you like to know? Yes. <laughs> okay. So my very rapid assessment, and I'm excited because this actually means we can dive deeper. Um, I feel like, you know, the general checklist of, are you confident on a date? Hell yeah. Can you flirt like no one's business? I have a feeling yes. Do you have nervous dating habits? Sounds like you don't. Sounds like the issue is something else entirely that has nothing to do with how you're presenting on dates. You're presenting as your authentic self. Love it. You're my favorite kind of person to have these conversations with because it's not you. It's who you're choosing is the problem. 
Mm-hmm. You're just picking the wrong guys. Like Always. nothing is wrong with you. You're fantastic. Not, not only are you the whole package, but you know how to show up on dates and impress and like get subsequent ones. Your issue is you're just doing all of this for the wrong people. I know. Okay. Well, I am dating a nice guy that I actually like right now too. I actually do like Okay. Him. So this is neither, neither Luke nor Brian. Yeah, neither Luke nor Brian. This is he, he's actually a potato farmer. He is very consistent and very honest and I do like him. But Luke is lingering in my mind. I can't lie about that, but I think it's the penis if I'm being honest. Sounds like it might be the penis. Like I mean it's so big. JD, it's so <laughs> big. I've never <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. Like science? For science, I feel like I have to find out for science. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I think it's really important to research for the rest of us. However, I think like really large penises, I think large ones are good, right? But when it gets to a point where they're like scientifically abnormally large, that just sounds painful to me. Okay. My whole problem is this conversation because what if the potato farmer listens to this and now he knows about the giant penis guy? You know what I I mean? And now he's only going to be able to grow small potatoes. Because oh my of your God. podcast. Now he's going to be thinking about the size of his potatoes. And I'm like, I, I don't even care about penis size, but I'm just so curious because I've never seen anything like this in my life. You know what I mean? So, okay. So you have made it to that stage with him. Well, I've touched it. That's it. Okay. So no, but you've on. seen it. It has not been inside of you. It's never like erupted either around me. No, it's never been inside me of any orifice of my body. And I've never seen anything projectile from it, but I've touched it. I've seen it all those things it just nothing has like escalated from there you know what I mean so it could be even bigger than you've seen oh my god is what you're telling me yes (laughs) you understand the dilemma here it's a real it's a real problem okay like I don't know I feel like I just have to do it even just like is that bad can I just well let's see do you know the size of the potato farmer's penis no I've no I don't not even close we're not even close to that you know, wait till you see it. And then maybe he will pleasantly surprise you. And then you can include him in your research. But he is six foot five and tall guys tend to not have huge penises, which is fine. Like I'm not used to huge penises. I love all penis sizes except for like the lipsticks, obviously. But (sighs) I am going to his farm this weekend to sleep over. I'm spending the weekend at his farm. So, so see, see how much of a need you feel after that to explore other potatoes. But what (laughs) I will say, you are not, I just hope it's not a tater tot. (laughs) I hope, yeah, hopefully it's not a tater tot. Yeah. I'm hoping for a russet, not a tater tot, (laughs) not a golden, (laughs) little golden potato. (laughs) Yeah. Russets are solid. I, um, I would say that as fun as it is to consider and I'm certainly not stopping you. There are other women who've explored this territory before. And I will say I've not heard the experiences to be great. Yeah, I feel like men with big penises just have the audacity. Yeah, it's just it, it, it's got to hurt. There is such a thing as too big. I think they end up alone. If I'm being honest, I think men like that big end up alone because they have too much confidence. If you looked at him, you would be like the nerve he has to have a, such a big penis. Like you wouldn't even think he would, but he does. And it's insane. It's insane. It's okay. But I'm going to, I'm going to stop you right there. Right? This is the guy just to make sure I'm following this. Story. It's Luke. This is the guy who basically catfished you, right? Yeah. It is. To test yeah. you. To test me. Somebody with confidence who has large Dick confidence, right? Large genitals. Someone who truly is confident is not going to be so insecure that they feel like they need to test how you feel about them. And so I just want to point out, he might not be as confident as you think. He has the BD, but no E. Yes, exactly. Mm. Missing the E. The E is, E stands for everything. You're right. You're right. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay. Since we're doing this, I'm going to be totally honest with you. what, What my problem is for real. Okay. I go crazy, actually. Like, I am crazy, for real. (laughs) (laughs) This is what happens, okay? I will have sex, okay? And then I love you. If Unless it's horrible. If it's horrible, then I'm like, I don't care. 
which rarely happens because if I do actually get to the point where I'm having sex with you, there's like definitely a solid connection. So it's likely that it's going to be good Um, because I don't have random sex and my number is shockingly low for the way for how loud my mouth is. And then I start overanalyzing everything they do. And I think they hate me within like 48 hours to 72 hours. Do they actually start to distance themselves or you are paranoid that's going to happen and your behavior changes because of it? My behavior changes. It has nothing to do with them. Like I think because I'm expecting after I have sex, like for the red carpet to be rolled out, which is why now I have changed my dating habits. And I'm very explicit with men when dating that if we are, and this is why I really like, I've only been with one person since I've been in Florida, which has been since December, I'm very explicit with people now in saying when I sleep with somebody, I develop an attachment for them. So if you're not ready for that, then don't sleep with me. Pretty simple. Does sex usually come before, like you say, I will have sex with you if we are exclusive or do you ever get exclusive first and then sleep with someone? I mean, I, this is all very new. So I, it's always before the sex now. Because basically what happened is I met somebody who in my mind was like perfect for me and we got along really well and then we slept together and it was the best sex I ever had in my life. And then I kind of went crazy because he liked taking things slow and he told me that from the beginning, but I wanted to move things faster. And because I was like, we're having sex. I like you. You like me. Why are we being slow? We were moving at different paces and it didn't work out. So I realize that next person I like, I need to be honest with them and say, if we have sex, like I'm going to want, if it, if it's good, I'm going to want to escalate quickly. So it's good. You're aware of that. I'm going to reframe the narrative for you a little bit. Like, I think you're telling yourself this fun story that you turn into this crazy person. I think what really happens after sex is that you have everything else kind of stripped away, literally. And you're at your most vulnerable, even if you're presenting more authentically early on, you are at that point, they are seeing the real you. And I don't think the real you is crazy. The real you is just you unfiltered. Because of that, if it's very different from what they've seen before, it can be off-putting for someone because they feel like they didn't really know you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. When you meet the right guy and you sleep together, whether you're exclusive or not, you're going to turn into like this complete 100% real version of yourself. And it's going to make him want to be with you more. But for the wrong person, it might make them run away. And so it's not that you turn into a crazy person after you have sex. It's that everything is stripped away literally and you just become your actual self. And so that is really exciting for the right person. And for the wrong person, they might be like, what the hell? Like, this wasn't your personality before. Okay, let me let me say something. I'm not always crazy. I just get crazy. This is what I said to the last guy. I put my worst foot forward and I can't help it. I like will unintentionally test you and then it kind of dies down. Like some people have their representative dating for like the first three months and then they turn into a crazy person where I'm crazy up front and then I turn into a normal person. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And I think what you need to do is you need to be your real self sooner. And there's clearly there's reasons that that's not happening. And I think it would be really fun to unpack what those reasons might be. Yeah. God, I'm going to be alone forever. Maybe I'll marry this potato farmer or the big dick guy. Probably not him. He's a freaking idiot. Let me tell you, he's so dumb. JD, (laughs) you don't even know. I've, you don't even know. Sounds like you've got a nice potato farmer who is waiting to see the real you. I do really like him. We've only gone out on one date. I felt very safe with him. And I like talking to him and I'm excited to see where it goes. But obviously when you've been out with somebody like a dozen times, you naturally gravitate towards the person that you know. So I already know I'm going to lose interest. I've already lost interest in this big dick man, but hopefully this conversation is helping. I mean, I've seen it enough times where I can kind of tell ahead of time whether something's going to work or not, but I already know that person has to go through their own journey. Like, You can't just take someone else's word for it. You have to 
see things through for yourself. Otherwise, you're going to look back with regret. And so, you know, if you've got to do the research, then do the research, right? But at the end of the day, you know, overall, is this going to be your guy? I feel like probably not. Yeah, no. Will it help lead you to your guy? It might, right? And so if that's something that you want to go through to get there, I don't know. Super supportive of that for you. Been there, done that, got a t-shirt. I can't. I'm done. I'm done with the lessons. I've learned them all. And uh, it's just, I can't. I got to, I got to give it up. I got to stop. Let me ask you something. General first date advice. What would you give a girl, a woman? All different date coaches are going to give you different answers. My answer is that I don't ever give the same answer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you specifically you first date advice because I really think that how everyone needs to show up might be different. And I think after talking to you, like my first date advice is before you go on your next date, try to do like a little bit of work inwardly and figure out what is stopping you from showing up on a first date the way that you show up after sex, because that is really who you are. And what is the fear there? What is holding you back from doing that? And try to unlock that because I do think once you start showing up in that way, it's going to automatically get rid of people that aren't right for you. It's going to make it clear to you when you have an actual genuine connection with someone. I think that's my biggest advice to you for a date one. Yeah, I need to think about that because I really don't have a filter in any aspect of my life. And your husband could probably tell you that. I feel like I've always been that way. And like, he's clearly the same way, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just go. And I, I don't think before I speak, I do try to present at least on the first date a little bit like cute and fun. And even if I hate the person, I'll still have a good time because obviously they're paying. Let me give them their money's worth. Let's like dance and laugh, even if I hate you. But... I, that made me sound like a prostitute, but that's fine. I think it's a great way to be, by the way, your dream guy, your future husband might be the cousin of a guy you go on a date with and you might not like him at all. Nothing happens, but if you're stuck up or you only give like, like 20 minutes of your time because, you know, you treat the guy like he's unworthy He's not going to think to make that introduction, right? But if you show up and you are like fun and playful and you're like, you know what? I'm here for an hour anyway. I might as well enjoy my food or drink and get to know this person. Maybe by the end, it'll be like, yeah, we don't have a connection, but oh my God, I think you would love my cousin. I totally agree. Cause I'm like, listen, I don't go out that often. So like if I got dressed, put makeup on, did my hair and I'm out with someone in my mind, I'm like, it doesn't mean it has to lead to sex or a relationship or anything. Let me just have fun with this person in general and get to get to know them as a human, even though I know in my core, it's never going to be anything. It doesn't really matter. It's like, I'm out. I'm here. You might as well have fun. And I never used to be that way. I would just immediately be like, get me the fuck out of here. But ever since I've been stuck at home and not in California, where I had like all these other options, as in like friends and things to do, I've changed my mindset. And I think I'll just always apply that for as long as I'm single of just enjoying wherever I am. I think that's so good. I mean, it's so healthy, so considerate of the other person. Women are not the only people who come home from a bad date and cry. I mean, I work with so many guys who have been on the receiving end of bad behavior too. And for a guy to like spend his night going out on a date, getting dressed up, paying Maybe it's not even money that he should really be spending to try to impress someone to feel so rejected. God, and even think about him, the men. I don't even think about them. How terrible is that? I'm like, most people <laughs> don't think about anyone but themselves in those situations. I mean, it, it's rare. God, I'm so entitled. I'm like not even thinking about the guy. I'm like, yeah, you should be, you should be doing that. Like, how dare you not? Like, why do I have to do anything? Poor men. Sometimes I feel bad for men. Honestly, I feel like someone's going to rip me apart for saying that. But like, sometimes I really do feel bad for men. Honestly, <laughs> I, it's hard out there. I feel bad for everyone. Like it was hard for me when I was dating. Like it's it is rough out there. And I think that it's a human, just universal 
experience. Like we're all in this together. Let's all treat each other nicely. But I will say, I think a lot of people, men and women, a lot of times bad things happen as a result of trying to spare feelings. It has the opposite effect. For example, there's so many people who will ghost someone because they don't want to say to them like, oh, I met someone else I like more or, you know, I just wasn't feeling the connection. They feel like, oh, if they just don't hear from me, they won't have to face the same kind of rejection when in reality, being upfront would provide closure. Not being straightforward will never yield good results. I love ghosting people, and I don't know if I can ever give it up. JD, I don't know if I can. I mean, maybe don't make it the first thing you work on, but add it to the list. You know, I'll just like, I'll go on a date, and if it's so horrible, I'll just block them on everything and then make a horrible video about it. Never say their name, of course. So, but see, what might happen is that guy might be at a have a cousin. (laughs) Well, yeah, that too, right? (laughs) Or he might be at a coffee shop the following week, see someone who could be the girl of his dreams, his future wife, but he doesn't ask for her phone number because he saw your video and was like so scarred that you ghosted him that he must be such a terrible catch. Like, how could someone not have the decency to like explain to me what I did wrong or why they don't want to see me again? And he doesn't approach the woman who actually could be great for him because he was scarred by the experience. Oh my God, I'm ruining men. Oh my God. Wow. 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 You know what? I'm kind of glad. I love men. I'm not a man hater. But I do think some men need to be told about themselves through my videos. There's only one specific guy. It was a horrible date. It was a horrible date. He like choked me during a kiss and called me blondie and said women, you know, he said bitches love the notebook. And I did make a video about that. I very much condone that. What I'm saying doesn't apply to 100% of the people. And I would be upset if you weren't doing these videos. Like, I think everyone benefits from hearing this and learns from it. And so I think doing the videos and ghosting are not mutually exclusive. Or I shouldn't say they don't necessarily have to go together. Like, you could tell a guy that, hey, you were an asshole. I don't want to see you again. And then do a video about him, too. That's true. Oh, my God. I think after this conversation, I'm exhausted of dating now. Oh, no. No, I want to have the opposite effect on you. I want to re-energize you and get out there to be your authentic self. You know what it is? I'm so motherfucking simple. I'm going to tell you exactly. I am looking for the perfect combination of toxic and wholesome And I really just want somebody who's reliable, funny, understands what I do, and there's good sex. Very simple. And wants to pay my taxes every year. And that's literally it. Anything but simple, what you just described. So really, (laughs) I want to get to the bottom of the toxicity line, right? I suspect it's not actually toxicity that you're drawn to, but maybe something else that you're calling toxicity, right? What is it about the men that you say are toxic that you actually want to end up with? Is it a hidden edge? Like, like, what is it about them? I know exactly what it is. The men that I have fallen deeply in love with, that I've had beautiful but tragic relationships with have all been drug addicts. I don't do drugs, but I didn't even know they were drug addicts until it was too late, till I was already so deeply in love with them. And when you are in a relationship and loving someone who has an addiction problem, there are so many ups and downs and the ups are so up. And I think I myself might be a love addict in a way, but not to the point where I'm like destroying my life. The toxic is really just like, I am a hopeless romantic. And because I have dated men and fallen in love with men who are drug addicts, when they are high, the love connection is so extreme. And I naturally can feel those things and do that without any drugs. They needed the drugs to get to that place. And when I was in relationships with sober people, I never felt that because they could never match my energy sober. So I think the toxic comes from just the insane highs that I felt from their high, like it was a contact high of just like our connection and it being so crazy and us being inseparable and 
with that, I've never experienced a relationship where it's been so insane and there's so much love without a little toxicity involved. I'm going to tell you why I'm excited for you. I'm excited for you because you're yet to experience something I know that you eventually will, which is the exact same kind of high from a completely just healthy dynamic. Like I think that one day if everything goes according to the the plan I have for you in my mind, (laughs) I do think there's a world where you end up feeling that same high, just born out of genuine passion and love for another person where it's mutual and you're feeling it back from them. I mean, it's very complicated dating anyone with any sort of addiction problems, but you know, I take issue with this idea that that high can only come from someone with that background. I think I know, right, that you absolutely can feel what you're describing with someone else who doesn't have that. And that tells me that you're yet to experience it, which I think is a really cool thing because I have a feeling you're going to one day and you're going to look back and be like, oh, wow, I could have experience this in another way. Let me tell you this too. I do think it's possible as well because of this. So I was engaged and in that relationship, I loved that man more than anything. I remember when we first got together, I would start like with him in bed. I would start hysterically crying, thinking about the fact that one day he would die that I wouldn't be able to live. And he'd be like, it's okay, Alana. Like, I'm not going to die anytime soon. I'd be like, there could be a freak accident. And then what am I going to do? Like, I was so in love with him. But eventually he developed an issue, um, an intimacy issue that he would not get resolved because of whatever shame he had going to the doctor. And after a certain amount of time, like a year of not having sex, even like the night we got engaged didn't even have sex. I lost all attraction for him. And by the time he got the pill, I couldn't even think about touching him without being repulsed, which is why I say sex is important for me because without doing it for so long. And I know like you get married, you have kids that happens, but like we hadn't lived in or experienced enough life together where there was like a reason to make it work. And I was like, I can't marry somebody who I'm not having sex with. All the other boxes were checked with him as far as like the insane love feeling and the safety and the fun and everything. And him paying my taxes, of course. But (laughs) the sex box was not checked. That's a huge box. It's a huge box. It's like a giant box, actually. Yeah, I I would go so far as to say it is a mandatory box. You you have to, and, you know, obviously there were, it might have started out great and, and things changed and we can at a later point talk about reasons for that, right? But in terms of like a mandatory checklist of someone that you're going to end up with, you have to have physical chemistry. And that could look like different things for different people, but it has to be there. And it sounds like regardless of the reasons, it stopped being there between the two of you. I mean, that's understandable. And one day you are going to have all of it. I think you're going to, you're going to have insane physical chemistry with whoever you end up with. You're going to be vibing intellectually. And I think you're going to feel safe and be your complete self with them. And I think when you find that, obviously there are other things like the ability to communicate and loyalty and, you know, there's many, many layers, but I think what you have to have to start off with is that physical, emotional, and intellectual connection. Yeah. God. Okay. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to this guy's farm this weekend, right? I'm sleeping over. Should I have sex with him? I think it entirely depends on your ability to be okay afterward if the relationship doesn't escalate as quickly as you want it to. And I don't think any talk with him beforehand is going to ensure that that's going to happen. I think you shouldn't sleep with him until you feel like you're content with any outcome. I think I am. I don't even care anymore. 
That could be the Lexapro talking, but... I mean, look, there are people who genuinely hook up with someone and you don't hear from them and it's completely fine because you had a great time. If that's you in this situation, go for it. I'm all for people sleeping together on a first date. I have friends who are married and clients who are married to people they hooked up with on date one. You just have to be prepared if that doesn't end up happening that you're going to be fine. And if you genuinely will be, then just go have a good time. What this conversation has taught me, and it's something that I already knew, but I try to force myself to forget because I think a part of me is still addicted to the toxic shit and I need to get over that, is that dating is very simple. It should be very easy. And if somebody is testing you, if somebody is playing games, you just need to let it go. And that's it. It's very simple, regardless of the size of their penis. Hey, if that is how this conversation ends, I am such a fan. (laughs) If that's what you got out of it. That is what I got out of it. And it's a good reminder because I'm like, why am I even caring? It's honestly science is why I'm caring because it's just so big. But who cares? You know, whatever. Maybe I'll never I'll never have sex with a giant penis. That's okay. That's fine. I could I could live with that. (laughs) I feel like your body will thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll spare myself a UTI, that's for sure. <laughs> you were going to tell me, we were talking on the phone the other day, and I want to hear this story. Something about Patty Singer. That's her name, right? The matchmaker? Oh, the millionaire matchmaker who has that show with Nick Bial now? Yeah, which is so weird. But yeah, I, I don't even understand that. Like, what gives him the authority to have dating advice because you were cast on a dating show? Anyways, <sighs> It's a whole other thing. It's a whole other thing. He does give good advice sometimes, though, I will say. You think? I don't listen yeah. to Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I had the same opinion, and then I listened to some of his podcasts. I was pleasantly surprised. And he was like this. I felt like, even on the show, sort of like a level-headed voice of reason. And so, yeah, you'd be surprised. I actually think he he dishes out some good advice. That is a controversial opinion, I will tell you, from the Bachelor Nation world. A lot of people hate him. He has always seemed like a polarizing figure and I never quite understood it. Like I was always in the camp of finding him to be very likable and interesting. I totally saw why he rubbed people the wrong way, but it felt like, I don't know, when you're watching that show, I haven't watched it in a few seasons, but I was a big fan before and I always felt like there was sort of like a sterilness to it. Like it, people were not able to really just be unfiltered in a way. And it was very much, you know, obviously shows are edited and all of that. But I felt like he provided really good commentary that sort of grounded everything. I don't know. I found myself rooting for him and his journey and his journey. Oh my God. Can I ask you? You said you worked on Family Guy. Is Seth MacFarlane single, the writer, creator? I, I don't know what his current status is. When I worked for him, he, you know, he was dating a bunch, but he was not in a committed relationship during the years that I was working for him. I think we would be a perfect match. I'm just being honest. Unless he's gay. Interesting. He's he is definitely straight, but in terms of the compatibility, interesting. Kind of yeah. like it. Think about that for a second. I'm going to I'm going to think about that one. You know, I think we'd be a good match. I don't really know anything about him except I've watched some interviews in the past and he's cute. I honestly think we would jive. I think we would jive even just for a night, you know. I mean, I I am big fans of you both. So, if that ended up happening, it definitely has my my sign off. You could put us on your website. <laughs> yeah, I would love <laughs> to add you to my website with your with your consent. You have my full consent. You'll have to talk to Seth, my future husband, or my future one night stand, whatever whatever way it goes. So what was the story you were going to tell me about Patty? You know, I actually already told it in a way. So I guess this will just circle us back to the to the beginning. You asked me why I got into date coaching. She was the first person to ever try to convince me that it was something that I should explore. She had basically ceased to do matchmaking by the time I met her, like in a real way, you know, privately, not publicly for shows and stuff. She she really wasn't matchmaking anymore. She was just only doing date coaching and was talking to me about how fulfilling it was. And of course, like the more lucrative side and all of that that I shared. And 
I left her house having that conversation. Um, I was with my business partner at the time who met with her too. And I just remember leaving and telling my business partner, Lauren, I was like, oh yeah, like I'm never going to get into coaching. I mean, it was such a, it was, she's, she's fun. She is a character and I definitely got some good insight into the industry from her, but I walked away being like, oh yeah, I'm never getting into coaching. And then of course, years later, I was like, oh, Patty was onto something. It feels natural because you inherently learn about it. Like we said in the beginning, you have a book coming out eventually that you're working on. That's very exciting. What is your book going to be about? So I don't know if the title will change. It's coming out in the beginning of 2026 through Avid Reader, which is an imprint of Simon and & Schuster. And it's currently called Match Made in Hollywood. It's memoir style. I have clients of mine who are basically, or I should say three characters who are composites of clients that I've worked with. You actually really remind me of one. Um, I wish we had more time to get into it. But it's their journeys to find love and how I'm instrumental in those journeys, simultaneously getting a glimpse of what my own love story is with Dave, who was actually a client of mine at the company before he and I got together. I set him up five times with different oh women God. and no way. Yep. So that's a whole other thing. So the book is about, I'm a, you know, a small piece of it, but it's mostly like my commentary on these three clients journeys. First of all, I did not know that about you and Dave. And that is such a cool story in itself that he was a client and you set him up on five dates and then you ended up marrying him. Yes. He, he likes to joke that I knew all along. I, I knew all <laughs> along that I liked him for someone. Like when I met with him, I was so excited that, oh my gosh, like he's going to be such a great catch for one of my clients. I was in a relationship at the time. So I didn't quite let my mind go there. Although I thought he was like really cute and we had a good connection, but I was like dead focused on finding him a wife. and. Little did I know that I would become single and I would be the wife. Oh my uh, so God. It, it worked out. That is a Hallmark movie. Literally. That's a movie. That's what they say. Well, we'll see if the book gets turned into one. That is so cool. Oh my God. That's so cute. I also love how we've gotten through like an entire hour of the podcast and we didn't even get to talk about how you and Dave know each other. I know. We didn't. <laughs> He, he arms me with all the info. He does? Okay. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's so funny. He and I have a rule. We're like, I am not allowed to interact with any of your female friends unless I know if there is a history. Like, he knows he always has to tell me. And I have never had sex with your husband, JD. Okay? I'm just putting that on the record. I, yes. Yes. I That, <laughs> that I knew. Okay. That I knew. <laughs> well, what did he tell you? How do we know each other? Well, I know you. Okay. So you worked on some pilot in Atlanta that he also worked on. And I think there was like a strip club involved. There was some making out. Okay. He did. Okay. I love Dave for telling. Oh my God. He just earned so many points for telling you. Cause like you never know with men, but like I fucking love that he told you i mean it was literally so innocent that's why it's like it's so funny because like obviously it never it was just like you know whatever but um that makes me so freaking happy god i would want my husband to just tell me that because it's like literally not even that serious it's so funny i love it oh, oh as my soon god as, as he is friends with like every well not every but like most women that he's ever like dated or hooked up with or whatever. And I have to tell you, like, he has amazing taste in women. I love every single person he's ever gone on a date with that I've met. And so when he told me that, I was like, oh, she's probably awesome. So you're a it turns much out you better are. woman than me because I mean, if I was married and had a kid, I wouldn't give a fuck. But if I was like just dating somebody and they were like, oh yeah, we're going to go out with somebody or like, I'm going to have set, like, you're going to talk to this person. I, pro I mean, that's where my insecurities come out. Probably you're a confident woman. Wow. So much respect. I've you are too. You, you'd be surprised if you, if you were with someone that you felt confident with, I feel like you actually wouldn't feel that way. God, you have no idea how many points he has earned in my book of men. Because you just, men, you just don't know. They're so like weird. 
You know what I mean? I know. Well, hopefully this makes up for the way he reached out to you. No, I thought it was funny. It's more me. I'm crazy. That's why it's recipe for crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> but no, but um, it's like it's empowering. You're taking back the term. I'm trying to, but you know, I my I, I'm my own worst enemy. I really genuinely enjoyed this conversation, and I would love to have you you come back if you wanted to but this was really fun like I could like could talk to you forever totally I feel the same way I was looking at the clock because um my kid's walking in the door any minute and I was like oh no oh like we have to wrap up because this this was definitely a really fun conversation once again if you want to follow JD she's on Instagram as match made in Hollywood she is getting her Instagram pop in she has great advice go check her out We're going to have her back for sure. Even if I have to blackmail her, she's coming back and she's hooking me up with Seth McFarlane, who is my future husband. I am manifesting it starting now. 